Hello everyone and welcome. If you are new to this series, my name is Jason. If you are a returner, welcome back and to everyone, thanks for tuning in. Uh, as always, I like to do a quick quarantine update. Um, I did write a nifty little uh, day calculator here. Let me go ahead and switch. Um, so I wrote a little script that I can run that will just always give me how many days I've been in quarantine since I started. So uh, it does a little math for me. And so this is quarantine day 31. Not a whole lot of updates since my last time, um, but there's uh, something going on later today after work. I have a birthday party I'm going to. No, I'm not actually leaving my apartment. Um, it's a virtual birthday party. It's a Zoom meeting. It's going to be a lot of people. Uh, I'm not sure how that's going to work. Um, I know once you have a lot of people in Zoom meetings, um, it's hard to talk because everyone talks over each other. So that'll be interesting. Um, but I, I think it's a neat, neat idea because, um, you know, People still have birthdays. We just can't go somewhere and hang out and have dinner anymore or have parties. Um, but we can have Zoom meetings. We can dress up if we want to. Uh, I think this invitation says uh, either wear PJs or or dress up in like 1920s style. But I, I was just thinking about how it's going to work. Um, and I suppose if you uh, if there's too many people in the main room, you can make breakout rooms. You could have side conversations. I can even make a breakout room where we'll stream some like Jackbox party pack and and play a game where you you know connect on your phone. You can even just do Pictionary manually with just the uh, like Zoom annotations and things like that. So, anyways, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing you know what what's going to be like. So this is going to be my first um, quarantine birthday party that I'll be attending. So, uh, so that's my quick quarantine update for you. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on to Steven's video here, um, and. This is going to be all about test-driven development. So let's go ahead and switch scenes here and take a look. Yesterday, I released a video about making videos with videos inside of them. I made the following claim. With a single line of code, you could be the proud owner of a video like this one. The reality is you can't or you couldn't. At least at the time that I made the video, you couldn't do what the video said you could do. With a single line of code, you could be the proud owner of a video like this one. So was it a lie? No, it's something called test-driven development. Students learn about it in introductory coding classes, and it has long been a best practice for professional developers. And the idea is bizarrely simple. Write what your code should do before it does it. Uh, write what your code should do before it does it. Um, by the way, I did notice this in the um, in the previous video. Uh, he did say we can make this video, and when I looked at the code, it, it wasn't there. Um, so I thought, oh, maybe he just he's tweaking it or just still working on it, or maybe he just forgot to to push it out. But now I know is that um, the, he didn't actually write the code yet. So test driven development. This is something I've done. Um, you can do it in you know bigger scales and much smaller scales. But uh, uh, an example would be uh, like one of our previous uh, problems. We did Project Euler number one. It was to uh, get the sum of only the multiples of three or five from a list of numbers. So say that was my problem, and I wanted to write a function that did that. So in test-driven development, maybe the first step would be to write the test. So I would start with a small set of numbers, calculate the sum of all the multiples of three or five by hand, write down the answer. You can actually code a test um, that maybe runs a, a made up function, like a blank function, um, maybe a function that just returns zero. So it runs my function and it takes in a set of numbers and then the test should say um, the result should equal and then I can put in my uh, calculated by hand answer to compare to. Now, if my function uh, just returns zero to begin with, of course the test is gonna fail. So then the next step would be um, then to start start filling out that function and then uh, write it out so eventually the test passes. So it's kind of like working backwards. I'm working from the answer. I'm working from the results and testing it to compare it with the results and then writing it to make my function give me the results that I want. So yeah, so I think that sums up kind of what uh, Stephen means here by test-driven development. Uh, so let's go ahead and continue. Two before it does it. So when I said this, with a single line of code, you could be the proud owner of a video like this one. I was stating something that with my code, I would make come true. And so I spent today writing the minimal amount of code necessary to make that claim true. 
By the way, I, I do this a lot, even without coding an actual test. A lot of times I will just, if I want to write a quick function to do something, I will actually call that function. I'll just like use it where I need it, and then I'll go back and, and write it to make it work. Test-driven development is a little more involved in that because it's actually testing and, and actually comparing it and checking the results. So yeah, let's continue. You can find it on my GitHub. It's the same one I linked at the end of the first video. Steven with a PH, signing off. Edsger Dijkstra, a computer scientist of great renown, once said, It is a mistake to think that programmers' wares are programs. Program source code is just the accompanying material. My so if you don't know uh, Edgar Dijkstra, let's go ahead and look him up real quick. So I'll open up a, uh, let's see, Google, uh, let's wiki, I spelled it wrong. Uh, so, oh, that's the same, same photo. <laughs> Uh, and it looks like he's a, a Dutch system scientist, programmer, software engineer, SAS, also a theoretical physicist. And I've, I've read some of this and I do know uh, about him. He's a huge pioneer in just the field of computer science. In fact, before him, there wasn't, there wasn't actually a field of computer science. I believe programmers or programming in general was more of a uh, kind of puzzle solving, more of like a hobby or a craft. Edgar Dijkstra, he, he studied theoretical physics but you know he wanted to be a programmer um, but at the time a programmer wasn't a valid profession so then uh, he basically did a lot of work uh, a lot of studies and made the field of computer science and he's done a lot of work both in the, the uh, engineering perspective and the theoretical perspective he's paved the foundations for structured programming distributed computing lots of things so he's a, a very important figure in computer science and uh, let's go ahead and continue on in this video program source code is just the accompanying material my video made an argument for the value of some software and the software that i uploaded today is the accompanying material for that video the minimal amount of code required to deliver on that value. The video is the why, which explains the story, and then the code is the how. Everything else is subject to change except for a few important lines. And here's the paradox. They're the lines in the readme. They're the lines in my example files. They're ones that users of my code, other coders, they're lines that they would be able to write. And guess what? They are the lines I wrote first. And even before I wrote them as code, I wrote them on, on paper. When I did first write them in code, running them was an error. It was only by writing subsequent code that I made that error go away. It's test-driven development once again. Here's one of those lines of code now. This code, when run, gives me this video. Hi. Uh, pause right there. So this is the code that Steven run, ran from his repo called uh, Meta Viral Videos. Um, we'll dig into that repo later in, uh, in part two. Um, but here's the code, we can look at it, and you know, it's a couple lines, I think it's uh, seven lines of code here. So what, what do we think this does? And we can see it says uh, basic render. Um, and Steven mentioned something about how versus why, uh, we bring that up a lot, but he was saying that the video is actually the why. That's the, the, the product, that's the thing that's being made, and this function is the how to do it. Uh, right now, we have this kind of Mad Libs thing going on, if you saw from the video, where um, it plays Steven's bass video, which is right here. So you have the basic bass, that's a name of a function, and it passes in the bass video. And then it has these injected um, uh, smaller videos, or it makes them smaller and puts a, does the picture-in-picture -picture thing uh, in the corner, and I believe it goes in this order. Cat event two and then cat event three. Uh, at some point, it will show this uh, QR code and it will have some text. Um, and so right now, I'm just going through. These are all parameters of this function, and then this whole thing is a parameter of this function. And I'm guessing this is the file output. So it saves it as a MLT file, which is which is a shortcut file. So let's go ahead and see what this does. Code when run gives me this video. Hi. This is a video made by but I'll be speaking on their behalf. Long story short, wants you to join a Facebook group, which you can find here or here. Why? To bring people in the area together to ask one simple question. What can we do to help? 
here's the same. So if you notice, uh, the, the, the two videos were cat events. One had a longer meow than the other. And the shorter one, which I assume is supposed to be uh, your name, uh, is used twice. And Steven points out um, to reference your name. And I, I brought up Mad Libs earlier. This is a lot like Mad Libs where you like fill in a noun, fill in a location, fill in an adjective, and then it, it gets put into this story. And usually it's kind of funny. Um, there's some online Mad Libs generator. I suggest you look them up. They're pretty fun to mess with. And it's a great coding project. Uh, so this is basically the same Mad Libs project, except we're dealing with videos. Uh, so at some point, uh, there's the longer video here which is, I, I guess, the uh, where you say the location of your area. And then there's, uh, before that, there was some text up here and the, the image. Uh, so this was the first example. Oh, and here's the second example. Sorry, I'm skipping around a little bit. So this second example, Steven's going to play it in a second, but let's see if we can figure out what's different. We can see MVV2, so the file name is different, and the base is the same. But there's something different here, three and two. So remember, the, the last video was like the long meal. So I'm guessing we're going to see the longer meal um, at the first two parts. And then we're going to see the shorter one at the end. Uh, it still has the same QR code. Oh, and instead of saying hello world, it's going to say cat swap. So let's play. Since you're not really saying anything important so that you can have a chance to form a mental image of what that code will do when I run it. Which we just did. Will you notice the subtle difference? Hi. This is a video made by but I'll be speaking on their behalf. Long story short, wants you to join a Facebook group, which you can find here or here. Why? To bring people in the area together to ask one simple question. What can we do to help? Finally. Um, so yeah, so we could see the cat videos were swapped. Um, so we're gonna stop there. We're gonna save this for part two. If you uh, are watching on Udemy and uh, there'll be some assignments for you below uh, for everyone else, uh, thanks for watching and see you on the next video in part two.